Hey there, welcome to the stream home edition. I'm Josh Rushing sitting in for Femi OK, and you are joining me from my home in Fairfax, Virginia, while we're still under quarantine here. Today, we're talking about, you know, it's been a huge story, not just in the US, but across the world, Black Lives Matter, and, and many countries, EU countries, offered support for that and said that they stood in solidarity with it. But we're asking about what about the Black Lives at their southern border, the ones that are risking their lives to try to get across the Med to enter the EU and are being blocked and often pushed back to places like war torn Libya. Now we're joined by, oh wait, before we go, if you're watching this on YouTube, there's one thing I wanna bring up. Look over there to the right. You see that box there? That's actually a live YouTube chat. I'd love for you to engage in this conversation. We actually have a producer there right now who can take some of your questions, your comments, they're gonna get them to me and I will get them to this exciting panel of guests that I'm joined with. Now, I'm gonna ask the guests to actually introduce themselves. I'm gonna begin with Deanna. Deanna, can you tell us who you are and how you're related to this conversation? Hello, my name is uh, Deanna Dadush, and I'm an activist with uh, Watch the Med Alarm Phone. And uh, Watch the Med Alarm Phone is a um, grassroots network of activists all over Europe and North Africa that uh, supports people on the move, people who try to cross the Mediterranean Sea, and we provide a hotline service uh, for um, the people who are in distress at sea, and we relay their distress calls to the European Coast Guards. Yeah, we're going to set that up more, Deanna, uh, later in the show. I'm going to ask you to explain that again and how it works. Uh, going to move over to Frederick. Can you tell us a little bit about who you are? Hello, I'm Frederick. I'm the Director of Operation of SOS Mediterranean, which is an organization chartering uh, rescue ships. Uh, we, are res we are chartering the Ocean Viking, uh, which is uh, one of the rescue ships, civil rescue ships operating in the central Mediterranean. And I'm speaking from Marseille, France. Mm, thank you for joining us today. And Al Jazeera, English's own uh, for us. Gianni, can, can, will you introduce yourself? Hi, I so I just did, didn't I? I'm a, journalist. Your <laughs> yeah. I'm a journalist with Al Jazeera. I work on the website and I sort of uh, cover migration and human rights. And I happen to be on uh, the Ocean Viking last year, which uh, Frederick's SOS Med, they operate now. And for us, we wrote an incredible article we're going to talk more about here later in the show, but I'll show you right now. I just tweeted it out. It says Black Lives Matter, even the ones drowning in the Mediterranean. That's actually the idea that sparked this show today. So for us, thank you for that. Uh, Frederick, I'm going to begin with you. Numbers are actually down right now compared to previous years. I think 2016 was the high. Is, 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 what, what's happening out there on the waters? Is that a good thing? Why are the numbers down? It's always a good thing that uh, people are not risking their lives uh, in such conditions uh, in the life the, 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 in the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, the, 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 the question is, uh, uh, nevertheless, the situation continues over and over, and, uh, and we've seen people continuing crossing uh, year after year, uh, uh, especially this year in 2020. Uh, we had massive departure over the, the last months uh, when there was no rescue ship available, uh, no rescue capacity, and, and the consequence of that is that there, is, there are more people drowning, more people disappearing, and, and this route uh, remains uh, uh, known as uh, the, 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 the deadliest maritime route in the world, uh, and that's really uh, what's the problem, what's at stake here. Uh, is there... it, it, do I understand it correctly? You're, you're actually a captain of a ship who, who's out there rescuing the Ocean Vikings, is that right? I'm not the captain. I, I'm, I'm supporting the operations from, uh, from the shore. Uh, the, the ship is now uh, in Sicily. Uh, uh, we, we just ended a mission, actually, which started a month and a half ago, uh, did a full rescue operation and rescued 180 people. This was extremely uh, tough on board uh, because the ship has been left uh, without a uh, possibility to disembark the people for a very long period, for 10 days. Uh, this led to very dramatic situations on board. We had to declare a state of emergency and eventually uh, we were allowed disembarkation uh, a week, uh, two weeks ago uh, in Sicily. Uh, and following that, because uh, we are in a COVID pandemic situation and this makes it all more complicated. Uh, we've been uh, instructed to carry on a, a quarantine and the ship has been uh, under quarantine for the last two weeks. Uh, and it is actually today as we speak, uh, it's, it is actually being uh, released from the quarantine in Italy. What countries pre prevented you from embarking and why? The, the 
big issue, and this is the, the situation we're denouncing for more than two years now, is that uh, all European states, uh, they've been signing maritime conventions, which are extremely simple, extremely straightforward. They say any captain of any ship has a duty to assist people in distress at sea. This is a centuries old rule. Uh, uh, it has been uh, codified. It's very clear cut. So there is a duty to assist, but no one is doing it. Only uh, civilian rescue organizations are doing it now. Uh, and, and, and European states are mixing up their uh, policy, migration policy, uh, 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 imperative with the uh, they're mixing up this with the uh their the the duty to assist and and this is what we're denouncing i mean uh human lives comes first i mean you need to respect maritime convention you need to respect assistance to people in danger and then other considerations comes afterwards and this uh, resulted for the last two years uh, in a situation where systematically uh, uh whenever a ship uh, it can be a, a, an ngo ship like ours like the ocean viking but it can be also a commercial ship whenever a, a ship does it its duty to rescue people in the high seas in between southern Europe and Libya, uh, then it is being left at sea uh, for days, for weeks, uh, because there is a dispute about where should these people disembark. And maritime law, again, is very clear. People should disembark in a place of safety, in a place where people uh, are given support and in a place where their human rights are not abused and there is no risk for that. And uh, the place of safety more closed in this area of the world are uh, southern European states. Uh, they are closing their ports because they denounce that there is a lack of European solidarity, which we fully agree on that. I mean, there should be much more solidarity uh, from the European states to support the southern European states. But this is another issue. The, the, the issue is people need to disembark fast. And just an anecdote, sorry, but on, on the last rotation uh, of the Ocean Viking a couple of days ago, uh, we had a uh, suicide attempt. We had people jumping overboard. We had fights. We had people, uh, we had very, uh, very stressful situation just because people were left on a ship without any perspective. And this is exactly the situation that maritime law wants to prevent, saying that people need to disembark as soon as possible. They cannot be left on a ship, which is an emergency situation. Uh, you cannot leave 180 people on a ship like that uh, for days. I mean, this is a, a, a terrible situation. I want to bring in a, a um, we call him a commsat. It, it is from uh, someone in our community who recorded a video for us is actually an analyst on immigration in Greece named Joel uh, Hernandez. Can, can we bring him in here? Any state dealing with refugee flows will need to find a balance between receptive measures to safely register and process arrivals and restrictive measures to discourage irregular migration and deter human smuggling. By all means, there can be disagreement among us about where to strike the balance between reception and restriction. However, there cannot be disagreement among us about whether our migration policy should follow the law. Pushbacks are unlawful, full stop. And it is beneath the EU for them to happen on European soil or in European waters. Beneath the EU. Uh, I want to go to Deanna with, with, with that because you're actually with uh, an activist group and you have your, the alarm phone. I want to hear about that, but I, I'm curious, like, why it is that, that you guys are doing this rather than, you know, some either NGO or official, you know, country organization. First, tell us about the alarm phone, how it works, and then let's talk about why this responsibility seems to have fallen to people who just have found this situation unacceptable. Yes, as I was saying, the alarm phone uh, provides a relay to distress calls by uh, people in distress. So our role is really to, to um, uh, get in touch uh, with uh, people who are in distress at sea. They generally call us when uh, uh, they are in a distress situation and we try to relay their GPS coordinates to the authorities so that uh, rescue can happen. And the uh, alarm phone had to, uh, was initiated in 2014 because it was clear at the time that there was uh, uh, a lack of capacity and lack of willingness by European authorities to actually uh, rescue people at sea, and their uh, uh, distress calls were being ignored. So there, has been, there have been several events uh, the years uh, before where uh, boats in distress had alerted Maltese and Italian authorities, but they were uh, um, um, pushing the responsibility to one another without intervening, and this led to um, several shipwrecks and hundreds of people 
lost their lives because of these uh, delays in rescue and because of this non-assistance. Uh, so that's how, how the alarm phone started. The intention was to relay uh, the distress calls by people on, on distress and to put pressure on authorities to uh, rescue as quickly as possible, uh, to take responsibilities for people in distress and to avoid non-assistance uh, practices. You know, you, you mentioned how desperate the situation was out there and how that motivated you. I, I want to bring in another uh, comment from our community. This is from someone who works with MSF and English as uh, Doctors Without Borders named Hasiba Haj uh, Sarawi. Can we see her bike now? Pictures of, of a dead body on a deflated rubber dinghy drifting at sea for several weeks are symptomatic of the situation in the central Mediterranean Sea. Uh, Italy, Malta, Libya, the European Union, yeah, nobody's taking responsibility for saving lives of migrants, refugees and asylum seekers, but equally they are not treating uh, the remains of these people with the necessary dignity. The body should have been retrieved and should have been identified. Imagine for a second the distress of families looking at these pictures and thinking it could be their loved ones. She's talking about is uh, search and rescue teams have seen a some kind of vessel out there, like a rubber raft or something, floating with a dead body in it. As far as we know, at this moment, no one's even gone out and recovered this yet, and it's been out there for uh, a while now. In fact, this is one of the search and rescue um, operators that, that uh, tweeted about seeing the body and, and, and what it means that no one's picked it up. Let's, let's check out the tweet. The people die crossing the Mediterranean is the result of Europe building a fortress around itself. And when these dead are not laid to rest, that shows that the last bit of dignity that the EU had left has drowned with these people in the Med. We request safe and legal routes so that tragedies like this one do not have to occur again. Mm -hmm. Ross, you've actually been out there with them. I'm going to put up, uh, Al Jazeera has an interactive uh, page with some of your photos here. Can you tell us, uh, and while you do, I'm going to scroll through, through your photos because they're, they're really powerful. Um, can you tell us about some of the people you met and what you saw when, when, when you went with them? I mean, it was quite powerful uh, what you saw. It's uh, looking at these photos is one thing, but being actually out there, um, on the sea. I mean, the first photo that you saw, the sea was quite calm. But in the evening, sometimes we saw like a big swell, there was high waves and stuff. And these people were risking their lives just to get a shot at better life. Uh, there was people that left their country of origin two weeks ago. There were people that left their country of origin five years ago, and they were stuck on the way. They were stuck in Libya. Uh, they had left their families behind. They hadn't heard from them in weeks and weeks and weeks and months. And they knew that they were taking a risky journey. Um, but it's just, it just goes to show how bad the situation is in the country of origin that they want to leave that behind and take get on this journey, which they know may not end um, as well as they hope it to be. Um, they were like this one that you're seeing right now. She was 32 years old. She was in the eighth month of a pregnancy with twins. She actually said she's going to reach Europe and she's going to name the twins Ocean and Viking. So that was quite nice that even in those times they... They think of all those things. Uh, but um, there was people who wanted to play football in Europe. There was people who just wanted to get a better shot at life. There were people who were running away from uh, corruption. There were FGM um, victims. There were people who were running away from corrupt governments. There was people with personal issues. There was poverty. Uh, there was all sorts of torch torsion. So it's, I mean, the, the list is quite long, the behind people believe their homes and enduring uh, the situation on the way to Libya and then staying in Libya in what they've called as hell. Uh, and I remember one guy, he got rescued, he got on the ocean Viking and I spoke to him and in the first five seconds he told me that the situation in, in Libya is so bad that if the Libyan coast guards come right now, he's going to smash his head in the wall, slit his throat and jump off the ship and drown in the water instead of going back to Libya. Um, and that just goes to show how bad the situation is for them um, in Libya, what the situation is. And I mean, even getting on the rubber dinghy in the middle of the night with no guarantees they're going to reach Europe, they still choose to take that, make that journey, 
knowing fully well that they might not see land ever again, but it's just they want to take that risk, just even if it's like a one percent chance of uh, reaching Europe. So. So I'm seeing a lot of activity here in our YouTube um, chat over there, and there's this whole kind of sentiment that a number of people have that says, why does Europe need to accept these refugees? Can someone speak to that? This is not the question, if I may. Uh, um, mm -hmm. The question is not whether people need to, um, whether Europe need to accept or not accept these people. I mean, uh, we are be before that. Uh, the question is, there are human beings uh, droning at sea. Uh, should we rescue them or not? Uh, this is uh, extremely clear. There is a duty to assist, and these people need to be assisted. Whatever comes afterwards in terms of migratory uh, policies, etc., is another matter. But the, 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 any policy is only valid whenever uh, it is based on strong value, on principle, and on the rule of law. And this is what is disappearing in the, in the central Mediterranean today. And this is what we are denouncing uh, extremely hard, is that disregard for the law uh, and for the very basic human values of assisting people in danger. Uh, and this is far before uh, considering whether uh, these people uh, need to be uh, accepted, not accepted. I mean, there are laws, uh, people who need protections need to be protected. But before anything, people that are droning uh, needs to be rescued. And that is something that any CIFARA will, will, will repeat and repeat uh, ever and again. And here's this quote from Faraz's story that really broke my heart. In life, when you see you've lost everything, you're not afraid of anything anymore. You don't see the waves, you just see a boat, and that's your chance to get to freedom again. And a lot of these people, if they even do make it across safely, aren't getting to freedom because they're being pushed back to Libya, a war-torn a war country. Now, I know there's a case in Italy where a boat captain is going to be tried for picking up some people out of the water and returning them to Libya because in international water, uh, or I mean international law, Libya is not safe harbor. It, is, is that true? Can someone speak to that? Yeah, um, one of the uh, one of the main uh, uh, problems in the, that we are trying to denounce as an alarm phone uh, in the Central Mediterranean is that uh, European authorities rely on the Libyan Coast Guard to capture people at sea and to bring them back to Libya, which is uh, a violation of their rights. And instead of uh, uh, rescuing people at sea, European authorities wait for the Libyan Coast Guard to intervene. Um, and uh, just uh, a few days ago, the, Europe, the Italian parliament has signed a new agreement to finance and give uh, resources and money to the Libyan Coast Guard, which not only violates people's rights by bringing them back to the place where they are escaping from, where they are risking their lives to escape from, but also um, the Libyan Coast Guard is known for uh, uh, conducting very dangerous uh, interception operations. And uh, several times we've heard from people uh, who've been intercepted and who get in touch with us afterwards to document their story and to denounce what happened. Several times they tell us that we've lost people at sea, that during the interception operation people fell in the water or people jumped in the water because they didn't want to be taken back to Libya. And uh, uh, nobody looked for them, nobody searched for them. They just uh, died and there is no accountability process, there is uh, uh, no institution pushing the Libyan Coast Guard to actually save people in distress. Their only aim is to capture them at sea so that they don't reach European waters. And sometimes they even uh, intervene within um, European um, search and rescue zones, as it happened uh, in April 2020. Um, so, uh, for Alarm Phone and for many of the organizations that are active in the Central Mediterranean Sea, uh, one of the main demands is to stop financing the Libyan Coast Guard and to stop um, collaborating uh, with uh, Libyan authorities in uh, illegal pushbacks. We have a comment from Frederico Soda. Um, he's the Chief of Mission for the International Organization for Migration, IOM. In, Lib in Libya, he's the actual chief of mission there, and he says, responding to a question, and the stream talked to him earlier this week, he said, it's well documented as being very bad, detention's arbitrary, indefinite, so there really is not a legal process for people to get out of detention, 
um, or the finite amount of time that they stay there. So nothing has changed. It's been a bad situation for a number of years now, and we've been advocating for the end of these facilities and for improvement, but there's been limited progress. And yet, is there not an enormous contract with EU, the EU, to send refugees back to Libya? Like, how can that be the case? Did you did you find out anything about that on your trip, Ross? Yeah, so I mean, it's been there was a uh, an AP investigation as well recently, and it's been well documented in reports and stuff that the EU has been financing uh, the Libyan. Well, they call it coast guards, uh, but it's made up of uh, a lot of other groups. Um, so they have been funding, they have been training them. It's been uh, the equipment has been provided to them as well, uh, and they've been told to basically just keep these people away from European shores. And also, it's quite funny how the EU and Libya they come up and say we rescued these many migrants and refugees on sea, whereas what they're forgetting is it's not a rescue. They're taking these people who left unsafe shores of Libya back to those unsafe shores and back to the unsafe country. There's a war going on. We saw last year when the detention center was bombed, 53, I believe it was, migrants and refugees, they died. Um, and then we, we, we get these stories about what's happening in the unofficial detention centers that nobody has any record about. There's extortion, there's uh, rape, there's uh, all sorts of violence taking place. And uh, I mean, it's, it's all been funded, as you can see, from by the EU, because when people try and leave, they pay some of them pay some money to these smugglers just to get out of that. And then the EU funded Coast Guard, they send them back to where they escape from. And it, so it's this, it, it, there doesn't seem to be any sort of effort by the EU to make uh, things any easier for them. But as with this funding, it's just making it more and more difficult for them to cross. And also it's it's increasing the the casualty figures at sea as well. And by also hindering the process of rescue um, operations like the SOS Med, uh, Sea Watch and all the other people, it's also adding to the figures that die, that drown or that disappear on sea without without having any knowledge of what's gonna happen next. Some uh, people in our YouTube chat here, this is touring news, agrees with you. EU has paid the Libyan Coast Guard 90 million euros on how to police and detain migrants and send them back rather than investing uh, in the people for their life. And then lost my password says, this is more than a stain on EU's reputation. EU cannot call their Western world leader of human rights unless they understand the value of human life or the suffering of humans in distress. Frederick, what should happen here? What, what needs to change moving forward? We're a humanitarian organization. Uh, the, the solution is probably extremely complicated. Uh, it goes through some stability in Libya at some point. This is what we dream of at some point, and people will, ha will, will not have to take that uh, perilous journey, uh, which they have no choice. And we, we had repeatedly the same uh, testimony uh, on the Aquarius before and on the Ocean Viking of SOS Med. I mean, we've, over five years, we've done more than 31,000 rescue, I mean, rescued more than 31,000 people. And, and the testimonies are always the same about Libya and about the fact that people in class want to escape that place. Uh, so, the, the, so the long-term solution probably goes to uh, some kind of stability in Libya, have no capacity about that, but in the meantime, what we've seen over and over, whether there's a rescue ship available, whether there is no rescue ship available, whether there are strong deterrence policies, uh, when, whether there is criminalization against uh, NGOs like ours, uh, it doesn't change anything. People are afraid in media, and uh, the, the, there is an avoidance that is getting uh, stronger and stronger from, from states uh, to their responsibility to coordinate the rescues, to actually do the rescues themselves. And, and this is what we're denouncing, and the example of, uh, of uh, uh, that terrible uh, picture that, uh, that we've seen over the last week of, uh, of a body uh, being left so, uh, drifting over the central med is so symbolic of uh, a complete loss of, of, uh, of compass, a complete loss of, uh, of value uh, from the EU. And uh, I quite agree with your, with your, um, uh, with your reader on YouTube uh, on this comment. I mean, we are denouncing a very serious uh, loss of value of principles and on the rule of law again. Yeah, we're going to leave it there. I, I, I'm still looking at your photo here for us of, of them on the boat, and I keep thinking they don't see the waves, they see a boat. Um, Ross and I are going to be on Instagram Live here uh, 
to, to talk about this on the AJ Streams Instagram. You'll be able to find that at any point. It'll be saved on there. I'd like to thank all my guests for being with us today. And uh, hopefully this gets better as we move forward. Be well.